Hello and welcome to covidrecovery.ie. Never in its history has Ireland faced a crisis of the size and scope of the COVID-19 pandemic. Equally, the democratic system has never been tested as of now. Incredibly, law-abiding people are not allowed to visit their nearest and dearest. Innocent travellers are questioned by the Garda Síochána as to the purpose of their journey. And senior citizens are to all intents and purposes kept prisoners in their homes. Even the practice of Sunday worship is banned, unheard of since the penal laws of the 18th century. Yet, Without interrogation, a non-elected group, not representative of the people, has shut down economic, cultural and educational activity in the country. Across Ireland, those that dare question the accepted view lose their jobs, have their opinions ignored by the media or are savaged on Twitter. COVID Recovery is a group of medical and scientific professionals that seek to study the science, ask questions and offer alternatives. The information will be a series of webcasts over the coming days and weeks hosted by me. This is not about my opinions, however. As the great Eamon Dunphy famously said, it's not about what the interviewer knows, but what the guest knows. I will try and live up to that. Please watch and listen with an open mind. The future of our children and grandchildren is at stake. I'm joined now by Dr. Vincent Carl, who is a GP, but he also has a higher education in public health, and he also is uh, a fellow of the Royal College of Tropical Medicine. Dr. Carl, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Now, one of your key interests, of course, is cancer, and you're involved in uh, A or C cancer. You might explain what that is. Yeah, no, thank you very much for asking that question. I'm chairman of ARC Cancer Support, and we, we have three houses in Dublin, and we offer a range of services, mainly complementary services, to people and our carers who are living with cancer. Uh, Eccles Street, South Circular Road, and now beside St. Vincent's Hospital. And we work very much hand in glove with the outpatient departments, but we've gone virtual now as a result of the COVID lockdown. Sure. Obviously. So we're not just seeing the people we ought to be seeing. Now, Dr. Carl, I, I want to talk to you about cancer because you have an expertise in that area and lots of our guests are talking about COVID and so on. But the, the Cork Examiner had an article in which they said that 300,000 uh, cancer checks had been lost because of uh, the, the pandemic. What does that mean for the future of, of people who may have cancer or may in fact contract cancer in the near future? Well, that's, I mean, that's an enormously important question simply because it is possibly going to have a disastrous effect. I mean, our own Irish Cancer Society had a submission to the Oroctus and the language they used is very interesting. They said that the secondary deaths are potentially due to, due to COVID will dwarf the number of deaths caused by COVID. And that use of language to dwarf implies to me that there's the possibility of an almost, I suppose, large increase of, of cancers into the future because they're not being diagnosed. And the remarkable thing is, I mean, with the e-referrals from GPs, some of the major cancer referrals are down over 50%. I mean, for example, I mean, breast cancer is down, I think, by 55% of actual referrals and a whopping 72% decrease in e-referrals for skin cancer. Now, skin cancer, you know, there's a number of types of skin cancer, but the melanoma is not a very nice cancer. And I mean, 72% decrease in GP e-referrals is a remarkable number by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, well, uh, you know, I'm the guy who doesn't know anything here. I'm Joe Public, really, and representing the people watching this who aren't scientists or medics or whatever. And I've got to try and ask the question that they might well ask you if they met you in the street. So 
essentially what we have done, is it right? We have now done a trade-off. We have said, well, we can probably fix this COVID thing, but the price of fixing it is cancer, uh, and then to take it on one step further, because we're hearing about domestic abuse and violence, we're hearing about mental problems, we're hearing about suicide and all these other things. Is that, is that a, a good trade-off? Well, it was a very bad trade-off. I mean, first of all, with any trade-off, you always have a cost-benefit analysis. And as far as I'm aware, there isn't, isn't one done whatsoever. I mean, if you go back to March, April, it was a new virus. It hit us. We locked down. It was probably the right thing to do. While we got a handle on the disease, while we sort of understood his epidemiology, while we knew how bad it was, for the very simple reason, I mean, some people closely associated with Neffet, we were getting enormously pessimistic predictions about mass death and whatever. Now, none of that ever materialised, obviously, but at the point of time, back March, April, it scared us. So we had to get a handle on this. We had to try to get our knowledge lined up in such a way that we could move forward. Now, we have moved forward as a people in the sense that we're aware now of the epidemiology of the disease. 4% of people died who contacted COVID way back in March, April. Now it's a fraction of 1%. It's 0.25% or less. And the reason for that is the virus remains the same. If you look down an electron microscope, it's the same virus, but the epidemiology is completely different. The population groups affected are completely different. Everything about this disease now is completely different, except our thinking. We've had no evolved thought, no evolved leadership in this whole area. And that worries me enormously because there are vast secondary casualties here in the form of cancer, not to mention cardiovascular vascular disease which hasn't been mentioned and all the other types of I, I, I really don't want to put words in your mouth here uh, Dr. Carroll but, but, but what you have said is our thinking hasn't evolved but we have the same people clearly advising us to never then isn't there a question to be asked by all of us that if they, there is no evolved and every single person I am speaking to is saying that the position with COVID now is different from the position in COVID in March. Surely the position of our advisors should be different now from it was in March. I would think so. I mean, I'm baffled why that's not so, because you have a running situation, a rapidly moving scenario here, and you have, a, a, I suppose, a very stagnant but, but position point of view. And I, I frankly, as a medical doctor, I don't understand it. I mean, I, I, I haven't witnessed this before in any other scenario. Normally, within the world of medicine, you have healthy debate. Normally, you have, you have views and ranges of points of view. You have scholarly articles, and eventually, you have an element of consensus. There's been none of this here and and you know it, it it is quite remarkable in that way and um i i have very very serious prob problems around all of this i i mean the 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 british i think it's fair to say were bounced into lockdown in march because imperial college said eight hundred thousand people are going to die i think we were bounced into lockdown in march because uh the 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 modeler said eighty thousand people are going to die now that was monumentally wrong if 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 an economist had said you know there was going to be another eighty thousand unemployed he would would have been questioned if if anybody in any field of endeavor if somebody said it's going to be 80,000 more people in jails in every other field of endeavor they would have been questioned why as a medical doctor as an expert in public health as a fellow of the Royal College of Tropical Medicine Dr. Carroll why is that Allow me to answer. First of all, I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine. But Apologies. Leaving that aside, I mean, if that, that's, I, 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 the short answer is I don't know. But speaking now in a private and personal capacity, I mean, as a former public health doctor, as somebody who's involved as a senior medical officer in Ireland, in the HSE, in the Irish Health Service for many, many years, I mean, I can only presume that the, that the medics, I mean, who generally work below the radar in public health, we're not a very visible 
invisible bunch of people. But I would imagine that the medics clearly, I mean, have to give an element of advice. And if that advice is wrong, they'll be hung out to dry. So there's got to be an element of fear. Now, the politicians on their end, if they don't accept the medical advice, and if they're found to be wrong, they too will be hung out to dry. So from an electoral perspective, so this is driven by fear, a race to the common denominator, to the lowest common denominator, to a lack of evolved thinking, to a complete lockdown scenario in which there is no opportunity for lateral thinking. There's no opportunity for any sense of sort of, there's a total failure to update. There's a failure to evolve. And we're getting trapped in our past decisions. And that would strike me as the nub of the issue. It is hard for people listening, therefore, to, to uh, listening to you and others to have confidence in those who advise us, uh, to have confidence in Nefet, in turn to give the advice to the government. Um, isn't, isn't it normal, if this weren't this pandemic and we needed doctors, if, if it was the Great Depression of the 1920s or it was World War II or any of the various things that have struck us in, in the last century or more, wouldn't the political class be making the decision? But here isn't somebody else making the decision. I suppose because there's an element of expert knowledge. And I mean, that knowledge is obviously from a very small pool of people. I mean, public health was always a very small sort of Cinderella aspect of the Irish Health Service anyway. So the pool of knowledge, the pool of expertise isn't really great. I mean, a case in point could be made to have maybe a peer review of some of the decision making. But that's, but that's another thing. Allow me to say, George, I was completely and totally supportive of NEFID. And I, my support continues on a point by point, case by case basis regarding their decision making and in March and April I was very very supportive as I too was trying to come to terms with what struck us as a very very new scenario now obviously my confidence was completely placed in effort I rode in I did everything that obviously I was told to do and inform my patients my colleagues whoever else and we were all under one hymn sheet on that one but since then a lot has changed regarding the virus regarding its epidemiology and I don't see change coming from the decision making point of view and right. it's essential the public have confidence in, in decision making. Okay, let's talk about that fi finally with this question of confidence. If, if I did decades ago, uh, if my wife had been pregnant and morning sickness, I would have gone to some expert and he said, why don't you take this pill? This will be perfect. And then suddenly child is born with no arms and no legs, thalidomide. In this country, we are still suffering from the appalling decisions made in the cervical cancer issue. 221 women or more uh, with tests that failed, 18 of them already dead. The swine flu fever, 80 cases before the court of children who will never be able to hold down a job who were told this uh, vaccine is safe. We are, like, there's a great phrase that medics like to play God. But on this particular occasion, we have a right to question God. We have a right to question the medics. I mean, we have a right to question everybody. We have a right to question me and to question anybody presenting a point of view. And I mean, I think that's the great thing about democracy is a great thing about debate. We're all, all able to tease out the angles. Nobody has a monopoly on all wisdom, incidentally, although that may not be apparent by looking at, 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 at um, pronouncements in this area. All right, Dr. Carlin, thank you so much for joining me. GP, uh, also as he, an expert in public health, and am I correct in saying fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine? Indeed you are, George. That's, that's <laughs> thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure indeed. Thanks very much. Bye for now. I've been reading and listening to my next guest uh, for quite some time. He currently is a columnist with the Sunday Times, but my thought about him always was that he talked rather good sense. So when I picked up my copy of the Sunday Times recently and the headline was Neffet's numbers never added up to level five, I was really interested in David Quinn's thoughts. David Quinn, welcome to the programme. 
Well, uh, I thought it was really interesting, but you're going to tell me, rather than me tell you about your column, why did the numbers not add up to level five? Well, you see, like, if you go back to Leo Varadkar and that interview we gave with Claire Byrne there a few weeks ago, and this was um, October 5th, and Neffert had said, let's go into level five, and the government said, no, too soon. And Leo Varadkar, he goes on Claire Byrne Live and gives his interview in which he gave the reasons why it was too soon to go into level five. And, uh, and also, it'd be disproportionate. So he said, you know, 400,000 people on the pandemic unemployment benefit, You'd have to close down disability services again, mental health services again. Tens of thousands of businesses might never come back. And he said, so that's the cost of lockdown. So do we really need to do it? And he also said, the idea of the national plan was there was five levels. And you weren't supposed to go straight from two into five. You were supposed to do it stepwise. So it's supposed to go two, that's not working, go three, that's not working, go four, and only then five. And also Neffert was saying at the time, start of October, the hospitals were about to be overwhelmed again. And the HSE said to Leo and co, no, they're not about to be overwhelmed. So we didn't think there was a good enough reason for it. Now, two weeks later, they do go into um, level five because Tony Holland comes back to the job and he says, the figures are going all wrong, so we need to go into level five. And they were predicting that by the end of October, so this is uh, around October 15th, I'm making this recommendation, we went into level five again on the night of October 21st, 22nd. And they're predicting up, you know, about 2,000, 2,500 cases a day by the end of October, if we didn't do that. But if you actually look at the figures, around the time that we went into lockdown, then it was level three was beginning to have an effect. And remember as well, around the middle of October, they stopped us visiting each other's households. So they didn't allow any of that to take effect. They didn't allow any of this to be showing up in the figures. They just panicked into level five, worried by this vision of two or two and a half thousand people a day being confirmed to have it by the end of October. But if you look at the actual trend lines, level three plus the ban on household visits was already beginning to reduce the rate. And that wasn't allowed to have proper effect. And the result is we went into level five, in my view, seeing the figures now without proper justification. And then we end up with all the costs that Leah Varadkar spoke about in the interview on October 5th. Now, David, um, one of the things about this is, of course, you and I aren't scientists. And the former Minister for Health, uh, Minister Harris, famously said way back March, April or whatever, we will follow the science. And, and I think, certainly in my experience, in the English-speaking countries anyway, that kind of mantra has continued. But if the science, if it's not wrong or, or, or it takes the wrong ac action based on data, we shouldn't follow the science. And, and in effect, that's what Varadkar did. So what you're saying is that really they, they then lost their bottle from that famous Claire Byrne interview and followed the advice irrespective. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, basically. I mean, they should have, they say, what Neffert was saying was, we can't afford to wait to see what level three will do. We can't afford to wait to see what the ban on household visits will, will do. It'll be too late unless we go into level five now. And the government looks at these figures and it decides to believe Neffert's figures about the trend lines and not wait to see what level three and the ban on household visits will do, um, which they should have done. But you see, when they say, you and I are not scientists, so, you know, we don't know what we're talking about. We can still look at trend lines. You know, we can look to see, basically, when we went into lockdown on October 21st, there was nearly 1,200 cases confirmed that day. But two weeks later, which is sooner than level five could have any effect, it had already dropped by more than half. And by the way, it hasn't changed much in the meantime. We were down to maybe 500 cases a day being confirmed by the end of October. And now we're at about 400. And Neffert is giving more warnings. It's not low enough. And like, what else are they going to do? I mean, we're already in level five. So maybe they'll find it very hard to reduce it to less than 400 cases confirmed each day, unless they bring in really draconian measures and basically lock us completely indoors. And I mean, this would be, this would be disproportionate. And you see, this is the key thing. And this is why lay people like you and me are entitled to an opinion. Because what the scientists can do is they can say to us, okay, here's the infection rate of this disease, all right? Here's how deadly it is. 
Um, so that's on one side of the equation. But then on the other side of the equation, the guys like you and me, you know, are allowed to say, well, what will be the cost of lockdown? All right. What will be the cost in terms of jobs? What will be the cost in terms of missed cancer treatments, missed heart surgery? Um, what will be the cost in terms of smashed businesses, smashed livelihoods? And also increased poverty always leads to increased deaths. Recessions always increase the mortality rate. So the likes of you and I are entitled to say, oh, well, OK, you've told us what the risk of not going into lockdown is. Now, please tell us what the risk of going into lockdown is. And then it's a question of values. OK, what is, in our view, as citizens, the correct balance to strike between the one side of the equation being uh, the cost of not going into lockdown and the other side of the equation being the cost of going into lockdown. So every person in the country is entitled to an opinion on this. And the fact is, scientists don't even agree about this, right? Scientists don't agree about the deadliness of the infection, certainly more deadly than flu, but exactly how deadly. Because remember at the start of this, you had some scientists saying we could have up to 120,000 dead. Right, so it's, thank God, nothing like that. But it was never going to be like that. And they were talking about 5% of cases would end up in ICU. That never happened. 20% of cases would, uh, would end up in hospital. That never happened. So a lot of what they were saying at the start was actually wrong because they didn't know what they were dealing with. But again, just to repeat, you and I as non-scientists, as ordinary lay people, are entitled to ask, what is the proportionate approach to this? This is a question of opinion rather than fact. Um, when Miol Martin told us he, we were going into level five, he also said, you know, the reason we're doing this is so we'll all have Christmas. OK, I think he, he, he didn't sell that very well because I think the population thought, yeah, we might have Christmas, but we'll have a terrible January. Um, the rolling rock lockdown theory. I mean, within days... The chief medical officer, Dr. Hullam, was already cancelling Christmas. I mean, what are your thoughts about that? Well, you see, I mean, I kind of support a middle of the road kind of approach. So um, I don't go with those who say um, this isn't, really, you know, this is not really a pandemic and we don't really need to do much about it. Um, so I don't follow that approach, but I don't follow the lockdown approach. Not this time. It was, it was understandable in the early days in April and May because we didn't know what we were dealing with and we didn't know how much hidden undetected spread that had been before we slammed on the brakes. But if you don't know what you're dealing with and something appears in front of your car and you're going to speed and it's night, you know, you're going to slam on the brakes. That's the safe thing to do because you don't know what you're dealing with. But we've a, we've a much better idea of what we're dealing with now and, uh, and how deadly it is. And it's not as deadly as we thought it was, even though, again, it's worse than flu. So I take a kind of middle of the road approach. And the middle of the road approach at the moment is something like level three a modified version of level three. And we're going to have to live with a certain level because we can see that level five has not reduced it much below what level three and the ban of household visits was doing anyway. And this is the crucial point. And so now we have Nefford and Tony Holohan all worrying that the number of daily cases a day is still about 400 because that's what they've announced for the last few days is about 400 per day. So what are they telling us to do now? Again, are they telling us to go completely into our bunkers? And you see, you can see just by going out on the street, the people are very different this time to last time. Because in April and May, there was almost nobody on the street. Like I went into quite a lot of the Neffet press conferences in April and May, just to ask a few semi-tough questions, I hope. There was no cars on the road. It was easy to get parking near the, uh, you know, Bagger Street headquarters of the Department of Health. And you'd go into your local park, there was hardly anybody around. But this time, there's, still, there's way more traffic on the roads and there's way more people in your local park or wherever you go walking. So people aren't as scared this time. So what do you do? What, what would Neffet and the government have to do to stop people doing that? Are they going to basically you know, bring the police in and say, you can't leave your home anymore, except literally for shopping and almost nothing else in order to get it below 400? So it just seems to me we're actually not learning to live with COVID. We're still overly frightened by it and we're being overly cautious in our approach, and we're getting the balance wrong, and we're causing too much damage to the rest of society. But there is a thing in all aspects of life, like of, of history, and you look back at history, and the great old cliche, those who ignore history live to repeat it. Now, 
you said, and everybody knows, that they gave us these horrific figures at the start of hospitals overcrowded, people literally almost dying in the streets, all these doomsday predictions. Now, they were wrong. Why would they be right this time? Is it not a reasonable question to ask if you were wrong in April, maybe you're wrong in October, November as well? No? Well, you see, I mean, earlier, as I say, they were um, uh, frightening us with the prospect of tens of thousands of deaths, up to 120,000. Now, that wasn't an effort, admittedly. It was, um, it was one of the other experts. But others were predicting tens of thousands as well. They're often part of the zero COVID crew nowadays, by the way. But now they're saying that hundreds of deaths would be unacceptable too. But you see, we never take that attitude, you know, for anything else. Now, again, this, this thing, according to the experts that I'd be listening to, is deadlier than the flu. It seems to be about twice as deadly, maybe three times as deadly as the flu. So we can't treat it like ordinary flu season, which can also kill hundreds in a year. But like when there is an ordinary flu season or even a severe flu season like there was a couple of years ago, we don't lock down society. We don't stop frightening people. We don't tell older vulnerable people to stay in their house and not come out for the entire winter. We take a more proportionate approach. Now, if this thing is two or three times as bad as the flu, then we need to be two or three times more cautious. But we're being about 100 times more cautious. And that's the point. If this calls on us to be two or three times more cautious than we are in flu season, they're being a hundred times more cautious. And they should be maybe, I don't know, 10 times more cautious, but they're not being that. They're getting, you know, in order to crush COVID, they're crushing society and it's over the top. And again, as lay people, we're entitled to have that opinion, to wonder, are they getting the balance right? And to have a proper debate about that. So for example, Neffert again saying, oh, we're worried because we can't reduce the number below 400 per day. So people are saying, oh, well, we must listen to Neffert and become even more draconian. No, maybe we need to turn around and say to Neffert, have you got this right? Do we have to actually live with about four or 500 cases a day as the inevitable consequence of not getting completely draconian and over the top in our approach? Final question, and it does require a yes or no, really. Uh, do we want the real Varadkar to come back then and tell us about what should happen? We want the Varadkar of October 5th back who gave that interview uh, and not the, not the one of mid-October who, along with Hall Martin, agreed to lockdown. Thank you so much for joining me, David Quinn. Thank you. Thank you for being with us for what we hope has informed your opinion on this crucial issue for the country and its citizens. Our plan is to continue to bring the best information and research from guests that are leaders in their respective fields. You can keep up to date with everything we do and all our activities on covidrecovery.ie. Thank you.